Thank you for joining us on The Simple Truth, where we desire to do nothing but provide the simple truth. Today we're in Acts chapter 5, and we read a pretty interesting story. If you're familiar with that, if you're familiar with that already, you know it's about Ananias and Sapphira. So, uh, and this comes on the tales of what happened in chapter 4 with uh, somebody giving some money to the church, and apparently it might have drawn some attention, and, and these people, uh, other people were trying to do the same thing. Well, the Holy Spirit had some interesting takes on motivation, and that's what we're going to focus on now. So let's go ahead and read Acts chapter 5, a large portion actually, verses 1 through 11. And it says, But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias... Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things, and the young men arose and wrapped him up, carried him out, and buried him. Now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter answered her, Tell me, whether you sold the land for so much? She said, Yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead, and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. Interesting. So what's going on? Well, if you caught a few interesting phrases in there, it, it really helps give us some solid identity as to what the Holy Spirit is. Uh, in verse 3, uh, Luke writes that what he did was he lied to the Spirit. And in verse 4, Luke writes that Ananias lied to God. So in equating them together, the Bible is clearly saying that the Holy Spirit shares deity equal with God the Father. So we already know from our past studies that in both in John and elsewhere that Jesus also carries equality with God and now the Holy Spirit does as well. We read that's a common theme throughout the New Testament that these three always share equality with each other as being God. And that's where we get the idea for, of the Trinity from is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So there's just some, some evidence that validates the deity of the Holy Spirit. Um, I think the, the, the big point is here, there was nothing wrong with holding back some of the money. Uh, he, Peter even says that. In, in fact, it may have been wise considering the wave of poverty that would soon hit the Jerusalem church. The, so that's not the problem. And we may choose to do the same thing in our lives. Sell something and, and give part of it to the Lord. That's your choice. You don't have to give everything all the time to the Lord. Uh, all of your income, what would you live on? So the problem was lying about it. That's the issue. Um, if, you, if you make a mistake, you do something wrong, the always best thing to do is admit it, take your lumps, and move on. The problem <laughs> is we get to trying to cover ourselves up and lie about it, and we, nobody has to teach us this. This is something we learn as kids. Did you take that cookie from the jar? As crumbs are all around his mouth. <laughs> yeah, right. So we know very well how to, how to protect ourselves. So lying to the church is lying to the body of Christ. Lying to the Holy Spirit who indwells us. Lying to Jesus who is in our midst when two or three are gathered together. And ultimately lying to God who said to, bear, to not bear false witness. So we, we should not lie, <laughs> period. But if, if you want to try and put degrees on it, uh, what they did in lying to the church was bad. 
in that they lied to the church, lied to the body of Christ, lied to Jesus, lied to the Holy Spirit, lied to the Father. Bottom line. And you also ask fathers forgive you as you forgive you for their sins. Yes, that's the only remedy is forgiveness. So the essence of what Ananias and Sapphira did was they gambled against God. Planning on church failure, just in case, we better set some aside because you never know if this thing is going to last or not. And how do you think God felt about that kind of gambling against him? Don't gamble against God. Sapphira herself, she committed another sin by putting her relationship with her husband above her relationship with God. Who said to have no other gods before me? Was that difficult? Trying to keep your family relationships and your relationship with the Lord straight? Mm -hmm. It can be. Yes. But our relationship with God must be supreme above all other relationships. It must be. Luke talks about this back in Luke 14. Um, where was it? 25 through 27, Luke writes this. Now great multitudes went with, went with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes after me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So the cost of Christianity can be the cost of your family, can be the cost of the closest ones to you, it can be the cost of your very life. The question is, are we willing to put any of those above our relationship to the Lord? And so Sapphira gives a pretty clear demonstration of putting her relationship with her husband mm -hmm. above her relationship with the Lord instead of saying, you know what? My husband said to say yes, but no, we didn't sell it for that much. I, I got to tell the truth. I got to be honest with you. Um, instead, she took the easy way out uh, and lied. Let's continue in Luke 5, picking up where we left off in verse 12. And we're going to go down to, I think, where's the next break? 16? Something like that, yeah. 12 through 16. Luke writes... And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch, yet none of the rest dared join them. But the people esteemed them highly, and believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them, as a as a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. I say as, it should be also. Also a multitude <coughs> gathered together. Interesting portion of scripture. More people were added to the church, but they didn't group with those who were selling all. There was a close group who were uh, doing the supporting of the church, selling everything they had and giving all to the apostles. And in that group, nobody dared join them and continue doing that practice. But uh, lots of more people were added to the church. So that, it's not a contradiction. Nobody was added, yet more were added. Um, nobody added that click, if you will, inside the church. But yet the church continued to grow daily as the Lord added to them. So multitudes of unsaved were gathering to the church, and they were healed. Multitudes of unsaved. These people weren't Christians. They were just coming in from all over the place, all around, laying around the sick and, and those who were oppressed and demon-possessed, and they were being healed. So I think that desiring these moves of the Spirit the healings and such, they're truly great, but there is a more excellent way. And 
Paul makes that pretty clear in 1 Corinthians, the way he explains it. So I want to get into that, and this might take a little bit of time to, to unpack this one. So in 1 Corinthians, in chapter 12, the end of chapter 12 and going into 13, Paul explains that and helps clarify that, where he says in verse 27 of chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, Now you are the body of Christ and members individually, and God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second apo uh, prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the best gifts. Then he says, stop. Stop. And yet, I will show you a more excellent way. So if you think all that stuff is good, wait. Because what I'm about to show you is so much more better and above that. It's like you ain't seen nothing yet. You think all that stuff, that flashy stuff, all the cameras and the, and the, the, the healing services and the miracles are, are wonderful. The tongues, the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Paul's about to make a huge, huge leap. And he's going to explain something that, that must be correct. And, and actually has, in my opinion, a, a cut above all that stuff. Because if we are not operating in what he explains next, none of that other stuff matters, though it still goes on today and with the wrong part B, which is what we're going to explain next. And he goes on at the end of that verse, And yet I show you a more excellent way. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mis mysteries, and knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy, does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. So the, the thing here is, Paul saying, you think tongues are great? Without the right character, they're worthless. You think gift of prophecy is great? You think faith is great? I think there's a lot of people that think faith is great. I mean, you just watch the TV. There's many, many people that think faith is great. Faith that you could remove mountains without the proper character and nature in your heart is worthless, according to what Paul is teaching here. Because your character matters above the gifts of the Holy Spirit. As what Paul is saying here, I'm showing you a more excellent way. And so we, we can get caught up easily in the flashy, neat things and, and forget about our character and our nature. Because I don't think people realize, like, your thoughts determine your words, your words determine your actions, your actions determine your habits, habits mm -hmm. determine your character. Yep. Your character goes on to become, you know, I mean... Yeah, your destiny. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard that. Like so a thought, reap an action, so an action, reap a habit, so a habit, reap a lifestyle. So a lifestyle, reap a destiny. Yeah, yeah it, it all begins there. Um, I, I think it would be healthy for the whole church and all denominations everywhere, especially in America, to take a step back and reread just this portion of Scripture in 1 Corinthians and really do a checkup on themselves, every denomination, Every group, every branch of Christianity, anybody who names the name of Christ needs to take a step back, reread this portion, and make sure we're all following along these guidelines. Especially 4 through 8. Love suffers long and is kind. Are we kind? Love does not envy, does not parade itself around, is not puffed up, does not 
does not behave rudely, does not seek its own. We're not me first people, are we? Self-centered, looking out for number one, seeking our own, are we? No. <laughs> Paul taught that we should seek everybody else's benefit and welfare above our own. And if the whole church was doing that, how much better off would it be if everybody was looking out for each other instead of everyone looking out for themselves? <laughs> Everybody's looking out for themselves, huh? Does not seek its own, is not provoked. How many times do we are we so sensitive that the slightest little thing provokes us? The slightest little thing gets upset makes us upset. Thinks no evil. It is so easy to get off on uh, the, the wrong kind of thoughts in our head. Here we're told that love, true love, and if we're acting in Christ, does not think the evil. It does not jump to the false conclusion. It simply it thinks the best. It trusts. It doesn't rejoice in iniquity. You know, so many times we might not say the bad words, but yet we'll watch a TV show or movie where they say the bad words and we have no problem with it. So we're sinning vicariously. We might not do the actions that we witness in the movie theater, on the TV show, whatever, but yet we approve of them by watching them and sinning vicariously through them. We just that, as guilty. That is so true. I used to watch Two and a Half Men. I'd be laughing at it. Hmm. <clears throat> then when I broke my back and I was going through all that praying and I went to the young and I turned it on one night and I was like, I can't watch this anymore. Right. right. Because it's very denigrating to women and everything mm -hmm. else. I just, I just, I never watched it from then on in. Well, even the young, the, the actor that plays the young oh, boy the young in boy, it, yeah. he actually um, became saved. And oh, he really? was, to, yeah, he, he went off telling people, don't watch this show. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're, you're, it's, it's kind of like a, you got to yeah. watch it. Anyway. So you got to draw a line and really, really check yourself. And uh, I'm, I'm not standing in judgment over people. What I'm asking people to do is pray about this, read this, and ask the Holy Spirit to search your own individual lives because we're all on a different plane with the Holy Spirit. He's working in my life different than anybody else. And I, I'm not going to say, oh, you still do that or you still do that and throw a stick at you or throw a stone at you because, you know, him who was without sin, throw the first stone. But my encouragement is, as a pastor, to, to read this, pray about it, take a step back, and make sure we aren't doing those things uh, that would upset the flow of the Holy Spirit in our own lives and cut him off. Um, rejoice in the truth, bear all things, believe all things, hopes all things, endures all things. You know, for a Christian, for, for someone to do that, to, to not participate in the gossip and the rumors, to not participate in uh, the things of this world that can lead us uh, to thinking wrong thoughts, uh, to watching things, to listening to things, uh, to speculation, jumping to conclusions, False accusations. Um, if, if you want to see very, very good examples of that, we just had uh, three years of that in our own government. Very good examples of what not to do. And I think that's what the Lord meant when he said, do as they say, follow the law, but don't do as they do, because they're hypocrites. And that's what we have to be careful for. And, and that's why I'm not putting myself up as a pedestal before anybody. Like I said... Um, let him who is without sin throw the first stone. My hands are empty just like everybody else's. Um, following this pathway and making sure your character is where it should be, that you are operating along these standards produces that 8A eight, eight verse, that love never fails. You know, how much better is it when the Holy Spirit's operating in our lives when our character is along these lines, instead of us being duplicitous, saying we're this way, you know, how many times have people in the past said, come out 
advertising healing things and all it was is about the personality about the person come be healed at my great revival thing you know back in the 1800s and 1900s they'd advertise these things in big tent meetings or whatnot but how many of it was it real how many times were they scamming people with fake healings and so it's so easy to get caught off guard and get taken taken your Christianity out of context um, when if we would simply follow what the word says here watch your character and your nature because it doesn't do any good to be having all these things or looking like you have the gifts of the Holy Spirit when you're all out of whack and I I'm, do a healing service uh, this morning it was a guy who's just gone now who is from originally Greek but I did have a healing and mm. he emphasized and it was just a small group of 20 people mm. you know I don't really hear we would meet every Monday night at one of the big alleys and they brought him over and um, he implicitly said every time before he would even begin praying over anybody it is not I who am doing anything mm. it is the Holy Spirit you know I mean he emphasized that I don't know how many times that's what it should be so not not taking not credit right it, no. don't think I'm doing anything right. it's not me I'm just a vehicle of exactly the, the, he's the vessel a conduit for the flow. Right. Yep. That's how we all should be. <clears throat> that the Lord can do that and flow through us. Have I exhausted that? <laughs> Beat that dead horse. <laughs> um, Yay. <laughs> that, that chapter ends with verse 1 of the following chapter. If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. Okay. The, the order is... And those are different words. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. So the desire for gifts should not be greater than our pursuit of love. And our lifestyle is to be that chapter 13 lifestyle of 1 Corinthians 13, love. Okay? That, that love behaves itself appropriately according to that chapter. Now I have sufficiently exhausted it. Moving on, back to Acts chapter 5, where we left off, verse 17. Luke writes, Then the high priest rose up, and all those who were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation, and laid their hands on the apostles, and put them in the common prison. But at night an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors, and brought them out, and said, Go, stand in the temple, and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they had heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest and those with him came and called the council together with all the elders of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. So here's an interesting thing. You get arrested for something, an angel gets you out and says, go back to the exact place where you were arrested. It sounds kind of weird. Um, many, many times... We're looking up at the tapestry of God, and it's an unclear picture. When God looks down on the whole picture and sees the wonderful tapestry, and he might say something that doesn't make sense to us, that's because we're looking up, he's looking down. We have to take it by faith. Just do it. Let him do his thing. It's called reckless faith. So there were Christians in an increasingly hostile environment when they were told by God through the angel to continue doing what led to their arrest and in the same place. When God is in charge of your life, you can expect the unexpected. It's where he seems to function most. But, even in that, when you're functioning in the unexpected, you can always remember, back in Matthew, Jesus said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What a comfort. What a comfort. It's at the end of Matthew. Everybody knows that the Great Commission. Um, what a comfort. The Lord said, even even to make it hostile, make it weird, make it strange, 
don't worry. I will be with you always. So they could walk back into that temple courtyard, teach and preach the gospel again, even though that's where they just were arrested. Don't worry about it. <laughs> that's what I think this example of Israel wandering around the mountain for 40 years gives us you know it, it might take us 40 years around the same mountain to get it right um, let's hope and pray that we get it right before them but yeah. so he will never leave us and that's something we can rest in and I think we have one more portion of scripture we have two more, but we got one more big one. Two more big ones. Let's start at verse 22 where we left off. But when the officers came and did not find them in the prison, they returned and reported, saying, Indeed, we found the prison shut securely and the guards standing outside before the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now when the high priest, the captain of the temple, and the chief priests heard these things, they wondered what the outcome would be. So one came and told them, saying, Look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain went with the officers and brought them without violence. Key word. For they feared the people, lest they should be stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. And all the Sadducees just said, well, that's it. We just accept Jesus then, right? Mm -hmm. No. We wish. So how did this make the Sadducees feel? You brought this blood upon us. You know, you're making us look guilty of Christ. Well, who was it that was shouting crucify him? <laughs> <laughs> Duh, it was them. See, the Sadducees, just as a reminder, they don't believe in angels or in the resurrection. As we read in verse 19, what did that say? But at night an angel of the Lord opened the prison. Uh, wrong verse. I did put the wrong verse. I apologize. But the Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection or in angels. Oh yeah, I did put the right verse. Verse 19, but at night time, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors. See, they don't believe in angels, the Sadducees. They don't believe in the resurrection, as alluded to in verse 30. The God of our fathers who raised up Jesus, whom he murdered by hanging on a tree. Um, the answer to their question is in verse 33. When they heard this, they were furious and plotted to kill them. That's how it made the Sadducees feel. When the disciples said all this against them, who don't believe in angels or the resurrection, how did it make them feel? It made them feel like killing them. They plotted to kill them, which is nothing new. They plotted to kill Jesus. They plotted to kill Lazarus, whom Jesus raised from the dead. They're just plotting, 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 plotting to kill everywhere you go. Those are the kind of religious leaders that we should all just adore and follow and and just put on that pedestal. <laughs> when they plot to kill people, it's just, oh, that's the height of religiosity, right? Wow. But it kind of makes me wonder, how, how can you stay in such a position of leadership with, and I said the D word before, when you're so duplicitous, so deceptive? Um, but again, I can't stand in judgment. All we can do is take from these situations and learn from them being careful not to make the same mistakes ourselves. So look back in verse 28, which says, saying, did we not strictly command you 
to not teach in this name. And look, you fill Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. Well, it, after all, it was them shouting, crucify him. And verse 29 through 32 explains that it is our duty, regardless of the laws or political climate, to continue to be Christians and teach and preach the word of God as we have been instructed. We just read the, the, the uh, Great Commission out of Matthew, the end of Matthew, when Jesus gave us that commission to go make disciples of all men, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's our job. It's our mission. That didn't just come by suggestion from a, a nice religious leader. That was from God, the Son, who told us to do those things. The problem is when the world says, don't do those things. We have to draw a line in the sand and say, no, Jesus said, do those things. Preach the gospel. Win people to Christ. Get them free from their sins, asking forgiveness and, and being in repentance. That's the gospel. Rescuing people from the works of the enemy. And even in the, end, in the book of John, it, John wrote that Jesus came to destroy the works of the enemy. That's our mission, to be that fulfillment. So when the world disagrees with that and says, no, it's not politically correct, Jesus wasn't politi politically correct either. So when we're not, we find ourselves in good company, the best. Hebrews has something to say about all this. If we go to Hebrews 10.38, it's the last of my verses we're going to flip through. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 10.38 says, Anyone who has rejected Moses, Moses' law, dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Um, skip down to verse 38. Now the just shall live by faith, but anyone who draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. See, if we draw back, and well, you know, the government says this, and, and we really shouldn't be saying Merry Christmas, and we really shouldn't be doing all this, we shouldn't be doing all that, because it's not politically correct, and uh, we start shrinking back, and, and God says, My soul has no pleasure in him who shrinks back, because the just will live by faith. So you have a choice to make. Either be a Christian with all the consequences that come with it, or don't. That's why Jesus said, Make up your mind. Joshua said, Choose this day whom you're going to follow. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Jesus said, You know, count the cost. Unless you're willing to put me above all your family relationships, even your own life, and even if you're not willing to take up your cross and follow me, you're not worthy of me. You can't do it. So he didn't paint a rosy picture. He said, wait, before you make this commitment, count the cost. Because Christianity is not a feel-good religion. It hurts. Because we are declaring war on the most disgusting, maniacal. I don't have enough negative words to describe Satan, but he is ruthless and he is out to, to kill, steal, and destroy us. Still kill and destroy. He wants to steal your relationship with the Lord. He wants to kill you physically, and he wants to destroy you in hell. And Christ has come that we might have life and life more abundantly. There's the trade-off. See, we trade this life for life everlasting. See, down here we're not going to walk on streets of gold, so don't count on it. But up there, our retirement plan, again, is out of this world. Nothing can touch it. No 401k, nothing. The, the thing he wants the Lord is encouraging us is to stay with it. Stay true. Stay faithful. It might get rough. It might get difficult. You might experience bad things. The Lord doesn't leave you. He's always with you. He hasn't abandoned you. He knows these bad things are going to happen. And he even goes one step further and says, don't even draw back. Because my soul has no pleasure in those who draw back. But even take it one step further and go further with the Lord. That's where real Christianity is put to the test and meets the road. Let's end it with the last few verses here, 33 to the end. <clears throat> when they heard this, they were furious and plotted to kill them. So when the Sadducees heard their testimony, um, the disciples, they, they were furious. Verse 34, then one of the council stood up. A Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in respect by all the people, and commanded them to put the apostles outside for a little while. And he said to them, 
Men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what you intend to do regarding these men. For some time ago, Thaddeus, or Thaddeus, Thaddeus, however you want to pronounce it, rose up, claiming to be somebody. A number of men, about 400, joined him. He was slain, and all who obeyed him were scattered and came to nothing. After this man, Judas of Galilee, rose in the time or in the days of the census and drew away many people after him. He also perished, and all who obeyed him were dispersed. Pause for a second. That's one good sign of a cult following, is when the ringleader dies, the movement perishes. It's over. Christ died. The movement didn't perish. It grew phenomenally. Verse 38, And now I say to you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if it for if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight it, yet to fight against God. And they agreed with him. And when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded them, commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Even after they were beaten and told, don't do it anymore, they still were teaching. And daily? And they were doing it daily. And where? In private? No, in the temple and in every house. They did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Wow, what boldness. So they had a choice to make. The council did. They saw what happened when they crucified Jesus. Right now they have at least 5,000 men in Jerusalem who are now Christians. So the movement has grown astronomically. At, at one martyr's death. And so if they put two more to death, what could be the possible outcome? See, a martyr can produce thousands of converts. One martyr. And it seems like Gamaliel knew this. His advice was to just, just let it die away. As many movements have come and gone, it has died away. And that would be the test if it was of God or not. And I want to, what I want to do is contrast uh, verses 40 and 42, what we just read. Verse 40 said, And they agreed with him. And when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded them that they should not speak in the name of Jesus. In verse 42, And daily they were in the temple and in every house, and they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus Christ. Can you believe that? <coughs> We, here in America, <coughs> might be under the same situation. Uh, as America becomes increasingly hostile to Christ, we may, have, we may have to express that same boldness as our Christianity gets called on the carpet. What are we going to say when we're told, oh, you know, you really shouldn't teach from the Bible because it's filled with hate speech? Or that Christian religion is filled with hate. When I think that word has been overused so much, it's lost its meaning. You know, everybody says it about everything. Um, if you're like the color blue, you're a hater of the color red. And if you like the color red, you're a hater of the color blue. And really, it has just gotten so petty and so childish in, in the name calling and the petty bickering uh, among the different factions and groups in America, that these things, these, 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 these things, these, these movements have lost their meaning. They're losing their impact. Except for when it comes to hatred of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the only part that has remained consistent and remained true. These, if you could label, say one thing about all these groups that they have in common, it's a hatred of Jesus, a hatred of God, because God calls people to accountability, 
calls people to repentance. And that means you have to admit that what you're doing is wrong to begin with. And people don't do that. They would rather stay in their darkness and in their sin than come to the light of Christ. That's the bottom line. So, you have a choice to make as well. Uh, are we going to operate as Christians and stay true to the Lord and operate in that 1 Corinthians kind of love as a Christian? Or not. My encouragement is as we get ready to celebrate Christ, <laughs> let's make sure that we are, are being Christians. Um, and I've actually had to do a, a little soul searching and ask myself recently, what's the meaning of that word? Does that mean somebody who just invites Jesus into their heart, all of a sudden, boom, they just fall into that category of being a Christian? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think many people have invited Jesus into their heart that do not fit that category or live that life to be called a Christian. I think the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch because of the way they were living. They were living like Christ. That's why they were called Christians. When we and model ourselves that much after Christ, then we can wear that name, Christian. To me, that's an incredible honor that should not just be thrown around. That title, Christian, that's huge. That's huge. These people were laying their life down as martyrs. They were putting their lives on the line, suffering persecution all over the place, cast out of circles here, fired from jobs there to be called a Christian. May we have that kind of boldness in this century in the United States of America as the tables get turned and we continually proceed to be an anti-Christ nation. May we, Christians, live it with all the boldness they had and then we will experience all the glory of Christ walking with us. Because he said he'll never leave us or forsake us. He'll be with us. Just like Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego as he was with them through the fire. He never left any of those disciples as they were being persecuted and martyred. And he's still with them today. Over in these countries where they're martyred and persecuted more and more. China, North Korea, the Islamic held areas where the persecution is magnified and, and just horrible. It still goes on today, and Jesus is still there with them. We may get called on the carpet and be tested sooner or later. I don't know. I just pray that if it does happen, we have that same boldness and we don't shrink back. That the Lord bless us and keep us. I think people in those other countries have more boldness than us. I think it comes yeah, with it. They step yeah. out in, in the name yeah. of Christ, and they get persecuted probably for it, and they still continue it. Over here, I just wonder. You know, it's like, it's like you said, what if we get tested? Yeah. How many people are going to scatter? Right. Right. <laughs> That's what is happening. I think in the end of Revelation chapter 3, the Lord said that uh, the lukewarm. I brought. See you next week. For the service. Yes, I'll see you next week. All righty. The lukewarm he's going to spit out. And I think we see that all across America in our churches today and in Europe and in other uh, older Christian communities where they've just become lukewarm in their Christianity. The Lord's spitting them out and is boiling the church down to the core. And that's the group I think that's going to head into persecution. Um, and that's the group that's going to fly through it fantastically. We're, gonna, we're going to uh, have victory like never before, and that's when you're going to see real church growth is when that begins to happen more and more. Thank you for joining us. We'll venture into Chapter 6 next week. Have a good week, and Merry Christmas.